So good evening, members of the audience here with us this evening in Johannesburg, as well as apologies, force of habit. So good evening to the members of the audience present with us in Johannesburg this evening, as well as to our online audience joining us from throughout Africa and indeed the rest of the world. So I am Malcolm Davies, and on behalf of the uh, Transplant Advocacy Committee of the African Association of Nephrologists. It's my privilege to welcome you all to the inaugural Afran Transplant Symposium. Before we begin, I've been asked to give some housekeeping rules to our online audience. Please try to join from a quiet, distraction-free environment. Please make sure that your microphone is muted and your video turned off on entry into the virtual room. We would welcome your comments and questions, which we invite you to, pay, to post in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, which we'll address during the Q&A session um, after the talk. Now, last year, the Transplant Advocacy Committee undertook a needs survey um, throughout our membership um, on the continent. And um, some of the responses that we got um, are an important kind of prelude to the talk which Prof Mayers is going to deliver tonight. So a number of our respondents indicated that um, they would really appreciate it if we could institute regular academic meetings in transplantation. And um, a, a significant proportion of our respondents also indicated that their real desperate need on the continent was in terms of having practical points which they could follow in terms of initiating as well as um, extending the existing transplantation programs. And I'm delighted to say that for our inaugural lecture, we have succeeded in securing a speaker who is eminently qualified to um, provide both academic inspiration as well as practical pointers in the field of transplantation. So Professor Mayers is currently Emeritus Professor in the Division of Nephrology at Wits University, but his involvement in transplantation in the unit spans nearly five decades, I think, Prof, starting with the very first renal transplant undertaken on African soil. Prof Mayers, in his time at WITS, has trained generations of nephrologists, myself included. And I think we can say, Prof, I learned more from reading your notes in the transplant unit than I ever learned from a textbook. Prof Mayers is a gifted researcher and has published a number of papers related to transplantation. And I urge our colleagues joining us online from Africa to look out for his upcoming publications in the African Journal of Nephrology, um, which detail the history, not only of nephrology services in South Africa, but also have a particular emphasis on uh, transplantation. But it is perhaps Prof Mayer's dedication to improving access to treatment, including transplantation for all patients in need that will constitute his greatest legacy. And in today's talk, Prof will describe his experience in the initiation and growth of renal transplant services in South Africa, a journey which is fascinating in its own right but also perhaps one with important lessons for those of us on the continent seeking to capacitate our own programs. And so without further delay, over to Prof. Thank you, Malcolm. Can we just have that first slide up, please? Um, Mark? But I must start thank
sorry, Dr. Davies, we've lost the sound. We aren't picking up the sound on the presentation. Can you maybe stop and start again? My apologies, we'll do so. Please let me know if it doesn't pick up. Okay. And it was organized for me when I was funded to go over to his department where he would get the uh, and nephrologists would be able to transplant and get the nurses, the pathologists it would be a big team and they would meet me and they would teach me and bring me out. And then I had to become very big back with the, the, what I learned. I had a travel grant and everything was set up. So I got there early and um, and I stayed in a B and b and I thought I would go for a a pole, a punt on the river Cam, Cambridge, Cam Bridge. So I went up for a punt on the river Cam. And my punt got stuck in the mud, and there I was in my best suit. I had taken my tie off, but I really looked smart, black shoes. And I fell in, and the water's very muddy there. Anyway, I swam to the side, left the, the boat where it was, and then I ran back to my boarding house. And the lady who owned it just took one look at me and burst out laughing. Anyway, she phoned uh, the Brook Hospital and said, said I'd be late. And uh, I was then carried off in a motor car and instead of getting there, one, I got there by quarter past one looking totally disheveled. They were all sitting around the table looking immaculate. They took one laugh, look at me and burst out laughing. And uh, from there, we, well, I learned a huge amount, including when I left. Given, being given a printed copy of this particular painting. And he, this man, was not just a world-famous painter, he was also a, a world-famous sculptor. So that's how... Now, in my earliest experience, the only people who are alive on this planet and were present when first transplants were done is Professor Nate Levine in New York, and myself. Um, Nate he actually is not involved with transplantation. Uh, he, he will come in later because he, he's involved in, in other things that are related to transplantation. But he and I are the only people on this planet who are, who are alive to, to, to tell the story. Uh, I don't think I should tell my age, but, but um, you know, I'm getting on. Um, I put it this way, I'm, I'm on the slippery slope. Anyway, the, the story unfolds in, in two major sections. The pre-1967, the very early days, and then 1967 on, on onwards. And when I say that the story consists of a dozen extra large eggs, these are, are sections in the history of nephrology which are currently in pub publication and it's going to be in the, in the uh, African Journal of, of, of Nephrology. So uh, it will be available, and uh, it's going to be several sections in that journal, and we look forward to, to that publication. There's a picture of Nati. He still looks young and uh, very fit. Uh, I'm on the right-hand side. I'm not quite sure how long that ago that was taken, but I haven't got much more hair now. Um, so it's just amazing that we have had an association from uh, probably from about 1966, as far back as 1966. And that would be both making it great. Uh, now, nothing could be uh, spoken about before we mentioned the, the giants of transplantation. And I can tell you this, the giants of transplantation, not just, not just in South Africa, but throughout the world of kidney transplantation. Now, before going to Tom Stiles and Bert Meyerbeck, just to go back on Bert Meyerbeck, in 1965, Bertie had gone to uh, Professor Usman in the University of Utah, where he learned all his um, transplant immunology. Now you just look for a transplant surgeon who knows the whole school of immunology, never mind transplant immunology, he understood the and the and everything. 
I don't think personally I've come across a more brilliant brain, and that includes famous people like Gare and Q, etc., in this country. Not a more brilliant brain than Bert. Bert unfortunately chain smoked and he never stopped talking. And then after he was finished uh, uh, in Utah, he then went to, to, to Tom, and Tom taught him the technical side of transplantation. So he became a real classy vascular surgeon for a couple of years. So when he came back, he had his uh, higher degree, et cetera. Later, Bert got a doctor of science. Um, and Tom Stasel was the first surgeon who was invited to South Africa by, by Bert, we offered. And he went to two related donors, two living donors. And I was there, the very first one, which was in um, 1966 in June, and the second, which was a couple of months later, I was allowed up in the gallery, uh, sitting behind thick plastic. And if I'd opened my mouth, I would have been chucked out. It was a very serious matter. And the operations, the anesthetist talk and the surgeons laugh, and that happened later. But this was pioneering days, and days that certainly I will never forget. Um, <clears throat> now the days were not without their without their um, harrowing experiences. I called it pioneering jealousies. We had a head of department of surgery. I'm not going to give his name, but he, he our, our, our nickname for him was God. So <laughs> he was a pretty powerful man. And when he did something, everybody jumped, including the chief matron. So <laughs> the, you can know that, 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 that he deserved that, that surname. And the perfect person, my book was the transplant surgeon, he'd come back. He was, I think in those days he could possibly doctor my bed. And there were several physicians, including myself, and two urologists. One I must name, name Dr. James Jordan. He's very famous in South Africa. He was a superb teacher, but a very um, arrogant person. And he said to Professor uh, uh, of Surgery, he said, um, so I, I, as a uro urologist, I'm going to be the charge of surgery and I'm going to run the department of transplantation. And these two said to, oh, you believe it or not, these two started hitting each other and, uh, with their fists in their face and their tummies and we all had to run and, 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 uh, and separate. Now, and it was, it was resolved, it was resolved because James retired, he, he actually retired from the hospital with him. Back, back into full-time private practice. But from that day onwards, there was a huge um, uh, body of teamwork uh, adopted between surgery, urologists, nephrology, which doesn't exist at the best anyway today, it doesn't catch up. And I'll, come to, I'll talk about that later, so I'll just leave it at that. That there's nothing better than psalm banking. That means working together. The good South African expression, working together. Now, the South African Renal Society was indeed the first national renal society in the world to be affiliated to the International Society of Nephrology. The National Kidney Foundation of South Africa was the second foundation formed after the American National Kidney Foundation. And the practical importance of these affiliations will become uh, Obvious later in the talk, so we just leave it at that. So let's then start on the formation of the South African Renal Society and the National Kidney Foundation. Professor James Gear, who is of great polio vaccine fame, um, he, a skunk, was behind him, but skunk in, in, the, in the UCLA was given the credit until James died when he actually, uh, the, it was written up in all the journals that he was the discoverer of um, 
on a polio vaccine. I think he should have got the Nobel Prize for it, but he didn't. <clears throat> uh, we, we, we had uh, two vascular surgeons at that time, several other, um, well, two surgeons, really, J.M. Meyerberg and PJP, or Noel von Bleck. They were the surgeons. One was a surgeon, one was a urologist. They worked together in harmony. And I'll, I'll say more about the urologists later. Natie was a, a nephrologist, myself. Now, Natie actually um, was not in any way interested in nephrology when he went back to, you, to the United States, when he emigrated to the United States. He was a preeminent nephrologist, but not, trans, not a transplant. Not, a, not, a, not involved in transplantation, but that's directly, indirectly, Nati traveled to um, Africa, where he started what was known as the Clean Water Foundation, so that people could be dialyzed. It, it was in West, Northwest, West Africa. Uh, they could be dialyzed, so they could have a transplant. So indirectly, he was, uh, he is, is, he not was, he still is remembered, and he visits there. Uh, regularly to make sure that this the clean water in other words distilled you know, proper dialysis quality water. Incredible, incredible story. <clears throat> um, at this time, when these societies started, we could not have functioned without funding. Uh, money comes into this whole talk as more and more as I go along. And um, we had a huge number of, of uh, dignitaries present when the uh, NKSA was formed and when the, uh, the first Congress of Nephrology took, took part. We also had a few transplant research papers then. And uh, from that day forward, we, we went out with, with uh, good funding, with substantial support by the city mayor and business Business, uh, businesses around the country. And I mean, forever, forever great brother. I mean, now, you can't, you can't even get a dollar. So now we go on to some of the other anecdotal things that have stuck in my mind about you know, what's my involvement in transplantation. Well, there you see a picture of uh, Dr. Louis of Vasca who was a superb, superb surgeon. He had skilled hands. He's a urologist. And um, Noel von Blerk, the he was, he was in private practice, and Noel von Blerk went to him and said, look, we've got a six-month-old baby. Can you do all the work? Uh, including the vascular anastomosis because it's too small for the bird myberg who at best had to wear these glasses these thick glasses his vision wasn't good <laughs> and and and, and, uh, and gus could see six six for, for his whole life uh, he passed away very recently very regrettably but um, he performed this operation this wasn't quite as shown on on, on the on the diagram there i can't remember the intricacies of it but those two donors and never looked back. They were fantastic. I mean, sorry, those two recipients. These they were, they were uh, extreme. It was two kidneys into one recipient. The two kidneys into one recipient. And and that was a, a man. He never looked back. Um, and uh, no, I don't know how many years that kidney lasted, but it did pretty well. Uh, by the way, at the bottom of the slide, uh, we, we are quoting uh, the sources of, of, of the references. And here is just another picture of, of Bert at an older age, and a picture of this incredible man, Mr. Dr. Mr. James Gare. And one more word about James. You can say, what on earth was a man who was a virologist doing in transplantation, doing in nephrology? Well, I can only say that James Gare was a lost cause, I think, to, to virology. I know he was outstanding. But he was, he, would, he, would, he loved nephrology. And he loved transplantation. 
And he loved any general. If you had a problem, you could get a hold of James Gear at any time of the day and night, and he'd come and solve the problem. He would could be a heart case, a kidney case, blur. He was just a, a natural born all rounder. Uh, although he, by trade, was a pathologist and a pathologist. <laughs> and I spoke about Bert. Bert, um, Bert's first wife, unfortunately, died, and he married again and uh, both very successful wives. But I'm mentioning the wives because both his wives, in fact, were widows for as long as he lived, because they never saw him. He was trapping. He would, he would come into your house and sit down and pull out a cigarette and start talking about the rejection. He's an incredible man. Now, the next big player uh, in my uh, he, this man is, is a big player. Now, I think most, most people or many people in the world have heard of Professor uh, Maurice Barnard. <clears throat> uh, I was involved with Maurice in the formation of the South African Transplant Society, which is an exercise which took from 67 to 70 for that to form. Uh, Morris was the chair of that committee, and, and I was the sort of secretary and kept everybody up to date. So then when, when we had got the constitution, we all went to deliver in 1970 for our first meeting. Now, the night before, we went over the constitution and said that next day we would have an election of office bearers. So that was done. And then we have a... We, 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 we suddenly then the following day in Durban, uh, even the members of Four Seasons Hotel, for those of you who know Durban. And the next day, um, the voting comes, and uh, Myberg was uh, a, a, propos a proposer and a seconder. And because Barnard, this famous Hartford, and had a proposer and a seconder. And I can tell you there must have been six to eight hundred people there at that meeting in this little country. And why? Why? Because it at those in those days, the, the, all the veterinarians came from, from our veterinary college because they were thinking of transplanting in animals. And then we have a place called Pelindaba. Those of you who remember the dark days of Africa, South Africa, we, we were excused, accused of making our own atomic bomb, which is true. Never set it off. But we had all the stuff at Pelindaba, and they made the isotopes of those days that we needed to do glomerular filtration rates and, and all good things. So they all came along. So there was a, a, a cross section of people at this um, first transplant meeting. Well, comes the voting time, uh, Professor Chris Barnard uh, received two votes, his proposer and, and seconder, <laughs> and Bert received the rest. And with that, Professor Chris Barnard walked out of the society. He, he never, he was going to give the opening address, and he was staying at a hotel in Durban, and uh, he was never seen again at any of our transplant meetings or, or the, or the surgical uh, research society. He, uh, we all know what a, an amazingly brilliant surgeon he was and how much charisma he had. I mean, he's an international figure, and I think everybody listening to, to this, this talk knows full well and, a, and an extremely good-looking good person as well. He was really a very good-looking man. And our thanks go to him, but we remember him fondly for what he did. But... Uh, Repeatedly, it wasn't in the field. He wasn't trained in the theoretical side of transplantation. He was purely a non-scientific, non-scientific, practical expert. Now, I've come to the part where I call it the dark days. In the old days, believe it or not. In Johannesburg, I'm talking my biggest experience obviously is from Johannesburg. 
we did not do tissue timing. We did no tissue timing at all. All we did was ABO blood groups. And, and um, then the tissue typing all came later. So when we, when we did a transplant, we had a state of affairs that was horrendous because in those days, uh, our dialysis considered, consisted of the old cough machine. You all remember the old cough machine. And um, it had a dialyzing membrane. It was a circular plastic membrane. Twin coil, they called it. Uh, and you dialyze your patient for eight hours, uh, twice a week. And you had to, you had to prime those things. We, we shared, we had, there were two patients on one machine. We, we had to prime, prime them with blood. And then where do you get the blood bank? You get blood from blood bank. So what happens? You get preformed antibodies like you, like you never know. So we had a series of hyper hyperacute rejections in 1967, like you've never known. I know all the patients, I know all their names, they don't need to mention them. Um, interesting, uh, and I've, I've put pig's, pig's livers, uh, I shouldn't really put pig's livers because that's a contentious issue, but what we have now learned is that pig's heart transplantations, not only do they work, the heart size is a very similar size, and there are no rejection episodes. Now, people have said, look, the light years for South South Africa gets so That's not so. These are being done routinely in some countries. I think in a couple of years, we will indeed be doing pink heart transplantation. And at this stage, I'll digress and say that the cardiologists at one of our local hospitals, and I hope they get other cardiologists are actually listening to this. They've also got a link because uh, they were the, the, the cardiologist will be the like a nephrologist looking after the patient before the transplant. They'll be the guys selecting their patients for a pig's heart transplant. And it won't wait like you used to, Dave. It would wait until the, sometimes you waited too long and the patient died of heart failure because you couldn't find a donor or the heart was, uh, was, was too bad. Function was too bad. Yeah, you've got a kind of millions of pigs. Uh, I'm not sure which breed or, or you know, any of the details, but the, the, these are the, these these are I call them dark days because there was no tissue typing, and the tissue typing, of course, made a huge difference to my mind. Now, tissue typing wasn't the only. Thing. I'll come back to. I don't, I don't need to mention it again, but. Horses and transplantation. What on earth horses got to do with transplantation? Um, I'm going to ask our chairman, Malcolm, Dr. Malcolm Davis. Do you know, Malcolm, what horses have got to do with kidney transplant? Yeah, you see, he's heard all about it. Now, these are horses that are, were kept not more than five kilometers where I am sitting giving you this talk on, on an agricultural farming hold, because in those days, out this way, this, these were all small holdings. If you look where I'm sitting now, now the city has spread most, most of its new part to, the, to where I'm living now. So these horses were on this agricultural farm. There were stables and four horses were singled out. I don't know how this was done. It was done by Professor Myberg, who hyperimmune hyper-immunize them to produce horse antithymocyte gamma globulin. And I used to go out, take the stuff back, and I went to our dispensary where it was purified in the Johannesburg Hospital Pharmacy and given about one hour just before a transplant and then subcutaneously for five days thereafter. It was an extremely painful injection. But uh, no sepsis occurred. Could you imagine what the, uh, the drugs committee would say now <laughs> if we did something like, we'd all be in jail. 
but it works not how just let me show you how it works This is, these are called the radical rays. Um, you can see um, on, the, on the top line that uh, this is the actual, act, actual survival rate. Uh, this was at, at the University of the Witwatersrand in 1968 and 69, I think up to 70. I'm not sure quite when the horses died. Um, up to 76 is the best. We had the best survival rates in the world. There were no other units. They didn't believe us, but we presented them. Yeah, we, we, we presented them to congresses. We published it in the in, in the Lancet and our the South African Medical Journal. Um, and there's our survival rate after five years. It's around about 70, nearly 80 percent, 78 percent five year survival. Um, that's kidney survival. It's not kidney and patient, that's just kidney survival. So you could say it's not just actuarial survival, it's actual survival. And here's the rest of the world, they were way down there. Anyway, then the high horses became hyperimmune and they developed uh, anti uh, an immune system disease themselves. And then we went and we used other ATGs, either the sheep, uh, uh, rabbit, whatever was used. And um, the halcyon days are over, is what we used to say. We were back to the rest of the world, which, which was still so wasn't bad, and we were we were happy. Now let's go to tissue typing itself, because again, some of the earliest tissue typing got done. Oh, tissue typing was done in Australia, and in England, and uh, in America, but some of the some of the most important comparative work was done in South Africa. And it was the, this work was really started, and our tissue typing was started by Professor Russell Brain. He was at the University of KwaZulu Natal, uh, where he uh, uh, was able to show, uh, as I'll show you later in the slide, uh, the importance in, 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 in uh, different race groups. That, that there was a total different HLA uh, profile between the race groups, which uh, weren't transplanted to any African patients in those days. But uh, later on, when we did, when you get an African patient has a transplant from it, so they say a Caucasian, there is a much bigger chance of a, uh, of a bone graft function. Um, Dr. Ernette de Toy is another lady who featured very prominently in Johannesburg for a while. She and uh, that's in tissue typing. She also worked with Cobble Firm, and I'll come to that in a minute. She was transferred to UCT in 1974. And there, together with a, a big department, she formed, um, it, was a, it was a sort of domain hematological and oncological to private, private laboratory run by Cape Town University, it wasn't a public body, we got partial funded. But uh, um, the cancer patients got uh, assessed by them. But she then did all the, the uh, tissue typing there. And Annette de Toy was also involved both in Johannesburg and in, and in Cape Town with the registry. So to summarize, the tissue typing is of paramount and related donors, as we've known. Less so to deceased donors because 90% success rate in the base span of ATG suggests a good rate of tolerance. However, now just look at this, although, so although the horse guys were doing well, two of our Johannesburg patients never took a single anti-rejection agent of the first year of transplantation. Mr. Willem Berger, 1968 to 1991, after the first year, he disappeared. We never saw him until we were notified by the district surgeon from uh, Nigel that he had uh, uh, died of a hematemesis. And we found that he had uh, alcoholic cirrhosis with normal kidneys. 
the, the, the district surgeon said he spoke to the family. He said, yes, he had a transplant, but he never took pills. And the surgeon was quite clued up. And he said that he called them liars. But he didn't like to do that, having just lost a, uh, a loved one. But Willem had so many blood transfusions. And I'll tell you how many he had. 167 pints of blood. He was, he, 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 he had, in, he himself had formed his own, what Beth used to call the Holy Grail, that is complete tolerance. And he would have lived his life. So it's not only the horses, you did it yourself. Now the next patient was another young, young man, much younger man. He, uh, he had an aortic valve replacement. And he just disappeared. We never saw him after the first year. And his doctor phoned up and said, look, I'm very sorry that he died. He had a, he had a, a heart attack. So you see, uh, tolerance does exist. Yeah. But we'll, we've only really got tolerance in the pig's heart, not liver or kidney. Here's a picture of it. it, it Wait, I'll go to the thing in the registry about that later. Now, let's just, there's a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new. Uh, picture on the left is Professor Len Eels, who was instrumental in starting the Renal Society, not transplant, but I put him there and he is that gentleman there, but that gent was the only picture I've got of Koppel Furman. That Koppel Furman initiated the registry. And the early registry, it, it, this wasn't registry transplant events. It, this was the registry of actuarial, what caused the kidney failure, what sort of glomerulonephritis was. What were the age and the sex of the patient? Uh, and the race, et cetera, et cetera. If we want who is a, a member of APRAN, a council member, et cetera, and a very senior, well known and respected uh, doctor. He has uh, uh, taken over the registry, and each year he improves, everything gets better year by year, and he is aware that other things are necessary, but it does take time because you know today you've got to you, you've got to collect data. It's not kind of shown on these the slides, but at one stage there used to be, I think, uh, about five or six public dialysis and transplant units, and perhaps uh, three private units. Now there are over 190 private units and still the same number of public units. In fact, less public units. We've lost. So, uh, so he's had to get somebody to, to, to collect that information. You try and collect information from a private unit. You, you've got a spreadsheet. Do you think there's no doctor who's going to help you? There's no nurse. They haven't got time. They're too busy with their patients. So he appoints a, a lady, and the lady's got a team. And so we, we, will, we are improving step by step uh, towards having a registry. Um, I know that, uh, you know that that other countries have got registries. And they, they are funded by huge institutions. So uh, we're not there yet. So as I say, we start, started by Cobble, moved to Cape Town, headed by Professor David's essential. And also good results in the old days, when we had a good registry, were rewarded by grants from government. Uh, I said we should be, but we did get some grants. And we certainly got, uh, we were certainly got grants from the private, private sector uh, in the early days. They saw that uh, it was a, it was a cost-effective treatment. Now, also many, many papers of research uh, came out of, of the unit. My experience related to essential information on kidney transplantations and was invaluable as this, what the research that I've done at the moment. And it's, a, it's an asset in that it can be used as, what I'm talking about now can be used as a, as a registry. 
uh, in, a, in a movement forward. Now we come to a, another aspect of it all, all together. This was a concept, I said a concept of bird fiber, but they had done some total lymphoid irradiation in, at the UCLA in, the, in, in California. However, they, they shielded the whole body from any radiation. So I'm afraid that the animals never got irradiation. We used baboons. So you can imagine what the greenies would do with, with uh, my bird and myself. Now I'm prepared to do a surgery. Yeah, it is just impossible to do any animal other than a rat or a mouse or a guinea pig. And we use baboons because they're pretty like us, you know. I don't know what the genetic homology is, but something like 97%. <laughs> so we, we probably all come from them originally. Uh, sorry, but with due respect to everybody who, who don't believe it. And what he did then was irradiate the ribs and the sternum and the spine and the spelt central pervis. He put lead things over them so the bone marrow wouldn't get flattened. Now, baboons had always rejected. You put one kidney into another baboon's body and it rejected. But they all sorts of things were tried. After he did this, he found no rejection. He irradiated them and took the one baboon's kidney out and put the other one, he had left the other one, he, 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 he had nephrectomized the other one, so the baboon just had a single kidney. And they lived normally with, with no dysfunction. They ate normally, they grew normally. They lived normally. And we kept in cages at the medical school in Johannesburg. It, you know, those days are, are over. But it did show, like the heart, peaked heart, it did show, and like those other two cases, Show that tolerance is, is, is possible. And that's what everybody's been working for is that holy grail. Now, what, what was our experience with these transplants? In humans, we did 11. 10 were in related living donors, and one was a deceased donor. We had two long term successes. Two deaths from sepsis because, boy, that bone marrow was flattened. Although you shielded, it took ages, ages to, to be revived. Most patients rejected. Only two out of 11 received tolerance. For the rest, the dark days were soon abandoned. We stopped it. And uh, it's, it's stopped work, 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 work worldwide. It produced literally thousands of, of research patients, patients around the world. And it is old fashioned and gone, but that's my experience with, through which I live. Now we turn to something completely different. And here I'm going to be as provocative as I ever could be, not quite yet, because of a couple of, uh, couple of uh, anecdotes are coming. First of all, in the early days, the on-call nephrologist was the kingpin for obtaining permission of, for donor, for donor. We used to be called out in the middle of the night, not the surgeon, not the transplant coordinator. Now they go and see, these, see the potential donors. I'm talking about deceased donors. We used to be called out, and we would see that there's brain death. And if there wasn't, we say to the trauma unit or the, uh, whatever it was, or the trauma ward, the patient's not, not dead, you've done this wrong, or the sodiums are wrong, or whatever. But well, before you made any decisions, we always called a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, and they would pronounce brain death. So the nephrologists, the urologists, transplants, and surgeons were involved with deceased transplantation. Their the surgeons, they, they were involved because it it was the operation was always at night and over the weekends, and they were all off golf courses or out of bed in the middle of the night. And uh, what you did what you had to do, and there was no moaning or grading, or, or and there was no um, diagnosis of I'm sorry to say of burnout. And, and don't tell me we weren't working as hard as, as, as the youngsters. There was no diagnosis of burnout. 
I think burnout is not just how much work you're doing. It's the fact that there's too much outside interference in not being able to do what you want to do and should do, which is coming. Yeah. Another very personal anecdote, my youngest son, who's now 53, he contributed to Orbit the Nation because he used to say, whenever a motorbike rode past, he used to say, there goes two of daddy's kidneys. And boy, in those days, motorbikes for the uh, motor, motor, <laughs> not motor vehicle accidents, motor bike accidents. Uh, we got more kidneys from them uh, than, than, than anything else, which is not relevant in the, these days because these big Harley Davidsons are, are as safe as, as cars. Uh, and uh, it just doesn't seem to happen. It's not that obviously it must be some, but not common. And we have got st statistics on that. Now, <clears throat> what is the role of the nephrologist in deceased donor transplantation? As I say, motor vehicle accidents from trauma units, neurosis, urgent brain tumors. We got it from the medical wards from brain tumors. That was a difficult matter because we were like a crowd of vultures. Because the people were alive, although they were on, 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 on uh, morphine, morphine, that sort of thing, they were alive. And you had to wait for the heart to stop beating. You said, sometimes you took that patient to theater and he stayed in theater for three days. It was just not on, I don't think. And uh, they were the only donors we ever obtained from medical wards. Medical wards with people dying of heart failure or other causes, other diseases have been taken, but I think that, that practice has also ceased. They, they talk about expanded donors, but I don't think. Um, the, 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 the infections, when, when, a donor, when a donor had to had severe uh, sepsis from a, a ventilator or something, we never took them. Now they do with antibiotics, they, so it, they, it has expanded. So, as I said, most of this work is now done by the transport coordinators, be it, you know, that's fine. And certification is given by either a surgeon or senior doctor, but never, ever a, a, a member of the transport team. Permission has to be given by an extra kin, and permission has to be obtained, obtained sorry, by the district surgeon uh, on, on, on call. Now, the neurosurgeons are involved. First of all, the, the neurosurgeons from Barabwana's Hospital, and uh, that, that gentleman actually came up and became professor of neurosurgery at the Johannesburg Hospital, and his unit was right next to the transplant unit, so it was very handy. Then they got hold of a doctor, Dr. Frank Snickers. Dr. Frank Snickers was South Africa's foremost neurosurgeon. He was famous throughout the world. Frank was a man who could build old cars, reconstruct his, he once reconstructed a, a car where there were only eight models in the world. And they used to say to him, but what, what if you put that part in and it doesn't work? So he said, look, that doesn't matter, you throw it away. What happens if I establish the brain and I'm working on it and that doesn't work? I know my job, the brain never gets damaged and my car get my cars get fixed. And he drove Rolls, Bentleys, and you name it. And his his his, his widow lives right next door to us, Mrs. Rhea Snickers, and uh, great, with great friends, and she'll be at this talk. And so we are very grateful to, to Frank for uh, cooperating for years, for years and years. He would get out of bed any day of the night and come and Look at the data and, and certify death. death. Uh, and, and, and he was incredibly kind man, and he speaks to relatives. And uh, he was responsible in, in, in us going up to 1991, I think it was about 123 transplants. That's with living donors. But it was in one unit. Gee, that's done in South Africa today you know, before I, I fall off backwards. I thought about getting. Now, now we're coming to the sticky part, and that's the government. 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the juicy part to the next slide. What is the government's role? Government should first of all create more dialysis facilities. So it can make sure that transplantation in the public centers are taking place, especially diseased donors, the disease, disease, deceased donors. So we've got to find that, we've got to have a, have a transplant coordinated to find donors. Meetings of government, the government between the nephrologists, transplant surgeons, and National Kidney Foundation have been in existence since the 1980s. So this is a game where the NKF comes in. We could not do without the NKF because the NKF actually broke at these meetings. And uh, I'll speak about Mr. Fani Natoya later, but he, he, he is a wonderful organizer. Even as recent as three and a half years ago, and in spite of our clearly presented protocol, nothing has progressed. And this talk I'm giving, Fani is uh, attempting to send a talk of this talk a copy of this talk to central government, and if, if possible, to, to Professor Ramaphosa, because Professor Ramaphosa uh, was responsible for awarding a kidney unit at Johannesburg Hospital with a grant of two million rand, which he collected. Two million rand. Uh, half a million was for his transplant research, a million for the creation of Two, three, three donor, three donor theatres right next to the transplant, uh, and right near Europe, the neurosurgeons, and then a donor deceased donor unit where they could keep the heart beating after brain death was, was took place. Well, unfortunately, with the new government transplantation, um, not not surprisingly, um, it was pretty well low in, in, in priority. Um, I think that people who are too fat, everybody in the government should know the cost effectiveness of getting done transplantation versus hemodialysis. Well, I think we've all we've all accepted that transplantation is the name of the game. Um, I know in our, in other countries, living donor has been a way of the top. It's, 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 it's so, in, 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 it's, it's, it, that is the case in South Africa, but we do not obtain the permission for this deceased donors, and I'll come to that in, in a minute. However, all dialysis and trans, transfer projects should be private public initiatives, but the dialysis unit and the transplants should be the academic hospital. So the private hospitals are sending their patients to be transplanted, both the living donor and deceased donor, in the government hospital. So the government gets the poodle, and, and not the private, otherwise it's the government's paying them to the private. And in Johannesburg, that's exactly what happens. Uh, we have our patients now being transplanted at the Donald Gordon Hospital, magnificent hospital, magnificent surgeons. And uh, it's the wrong way around. Now, this, this, this graph, what I've, I've tried to show, on, on, so on the left there, is the incidence of end-stage kidney failure per million population. That is the white population, that is the African indigenous population. As you can see, it's 20% versus 80%, 20% versus so the burden of kidney failure is much, much higher in the black population. And here are the number of transplants. The private guys get the transplants. And those people with the highest burden and the highest number don't get it. Now, all right, there are lots of reasons for this. It is changing a little bit. Uh, I think it, it used to be used to be 10% now, but let's say, be generous, say it's gone up to 20%. And I'm 
the bottom you, you, know, you can't read it, but it's, it, we call this a two-tiered system, a two-tiered uh, working system that is totally impossible to stay with. In the new South Africa, it is still going on, ladies and gentlemen. What are we doing? No, no, we can, no, we can come to uh, possible solutions. There are thousands of young South African black people who are perfectly able to be of great use to society who are dying every year. Why? Lack of facilities? Yes. Deceased donor refusals, superstitions, religious beliefs, suspicion with Muti, Muti using it with kiddies for Muti. They, people say you've got to go to heaven with your organs intact, in spite of there being a gun that was post mortem and a kidney's landing on a bench. There are many stories. They just, they, the Declaration of Istanbul, which said not only for living donors, no, no sale. But not but for cadaver donors, you, you, you couldn't sell it. No, sure you can't sell it, a cadaver donor. But I'll tell you how, how you how you how you can. Um, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, and I don't really think that the transplant coordinators would agree with this until they understand the position at the moment. Uh, they still believe in that in the old regime, but I hope by the end of my talk they don't. The Organ Donor Foundation, I'm sorry to say, is no, is no use to, to, to uh, practical use. They do a lot of other good, they, they raise money, but it doesn't get us organs, deceased or, or living. Now, Perhaps this is a little premature in saying this, but to create sister units between South African University and elsewhere in South Africa, people who've had experience here had to go, uh, you know, the sister unit concept was created by the ISN, where um, I know that Professor Sander and, and, and I can had sister units that were run by the ISN, funded by the ISN all over Africa, and she used to travel all over the world. I mean, it's remarkable with the ladies. Professor Sarah Naika is not a surgeon, she's a physician, but a remarkable a person indeed. So she taught the pharmacy, she taught dialysis uh, all over. And um, these now, we should use these systems to teach what is necessary for kidney transplantation. That would include a transplant nephrologist, transplant surgeon, somebody who's a knowledge. Knowledgeable as an immunologist. The funding should be done by the South African Society of Pathology. Uh, all countries uh, with transplant societies, drug companies, the Kidney Foundation is willing to assist, assist the brokers, but we haven't got any money. Uh, but we, 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 could, we could go out, not marching in the streets, but there, there are quite a few ways of possibly solving it. That is my solution. Now we come to the contentious issues. And let me just at this, at this at the outset say that I have discussed this with all the senior members in South Africa, both surgeons and, and, and nephrologists, particularly nephrologists. I've discussed it with American teams. Uh, I've discussed this with people of religion, etc. We do not consider that reimbursement of the family by the government as, 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 as a bribe. It's an indication of their gratitude for the decision of donating two de de deceased donor kidneys and other organs. So if the government then reimbursed them by paying for the funeral and paying for the after death, celebrations and I don't even believe that the that the uh, Istanbul people uh, would disagree with this at this stage or very few would I think the debate we put it out outside uh, I'm not saying I'm not coming out on religious side I'm talking about purely social 
I think it would sway 90% plus. Um, and look, the families can still repeal the refuse. They can still say, the families can say, no, I don't want that. I don't want the government's money. Well, I, that, I, I don't want that nieces or organs. So they don't refuse. And I think we'll get, we'll get, probably get quite a few, few organs this way. Knowing what mankind as I do, I'm not talking about any race group. You and me and all of us, we need to make a living. So even if there's only a 30 to 40 percent of potential donor families get the measure, a huge increase in the deceased donation would be anticipated. But we would not be able to 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 keep up with it because the government hasn't got a bottomless pit of funds. So this has then got to be taken step by step. It's a slow, ongoing process. And that, let me tell you, would be our, our solution. I don't think we should start sending kidneys overseas, etc. And I also don't think we should start flying kid kidneys from one center to another. We cannot afford it. This has got to be done by the teaching centers, most of whom not even transplant kidneys in the state. Um, I'll just put down a, a, a list of publications to show that a huge amount of awareness was made of the, the necessity of, of transplantation throughout the world and contributed to by Urologists, transplant surgeons, immunologists, pathologists, uh, nurses, etc., in lots of, of, of uh, uh, different types of, of, of a publication, as you, can, as you can see there. Uh, looking at perhaps some of the, my own publications. Mayors, Superior, Mill, etc., etc. I don't know how many of you uh, surgeons would have heard of strongyloides stercoralis hyperinfection in a renal allopurpurite recipient. I think it's occasionally seen, seen and, and um, it presents with lung hemorrhage, fecal secondary infection, and uh, we, we have the first case in the world. Of a transplantation, a, a patient came from Madeira. Now, Madeira is that little island in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's a cesspool for infections because everybody goes to Madeira when they're shipping because they will stop there for a quick holiday because you don't need a passport to land there. You can go and jol and drink what you like. <laughs> so it's not surprising this man came from Madeira. Then uh, other papers where I was the first author. We had lymph a paper on, on lymphocytes, which uh, was, was present to 232 transplant patients, 3.5 percent of, of, of all complications. So it's a, a rare post-operative post -operative complication. But if you don't die, there's, there's trouble. There's, you, you can feel a pelvic mass pain, and uh, you can even if you miss it, the patient could die of obstructive neuropathy. You don't know what it is, and it's easily diagnosed by ultrasound. And here's a nice picture of it. You can see the uh, that's where the lymphocyte is. It's pushing the kidney across, and you can't actually would see, but the, the ureter is very dilated, proximal to that, and it's completely blocked by, by this leak of lymphatic tissue. And it's usually a complication of uh, tying off the in, uh, inferior. Um, uh, artery to the kidney, a single small artery from the aorta as a, as a, as a single blood supply to the kidney. I, I don't think you see it anymore because we, we don't do those procedures anymore. Everything is done by penile surgery. So this is, this is real history. Then a, another extremely interesting anecdote. And here at the bottom, you see the name of Mr. Steve Beaker. Everybody in the world knows about Mr. Steve Beaker. Anyway, 
this patient, uh, not this patient, we had about five cases. Uh, I presented it at the International Congress in Athens. Um, it looked like there was a, the, don the donor, the kidney donor had, had thrombos, on biopsy, had a thrombocytopenic uh, vasculopathy, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which to call it without purpura. Now, and we nicknamed it the, uh, the donor DRC. Now, now how, how did we know about this? Well, I'll tell you how we knew about this. Prior uh, to, to these occurrences, we were never allowed to use kittens for transplanted biofilms in people who were murdered. Never. Gunshot or murder or anything. And then we managed to persuade the district surgeons that if we gave them a kidney biopsy, it is because they couldn't get the kidneys. If we gave them a kidney biopsy, after the clamps were released, and the kidney was nice and pink, we did it at surgery, we get a biopsy, gave, sent it to the district surgeon, and then they allowed us to, to, to use those kidneys. And the district surgeon sent back a whole crowd of them because they, they, they didn't react immediately, but they then sent the reports back and showed that the glomeruli were, were plugged up, what looked like that, with fibrin clots. But I think the net effect of this is all four kidneys worked. All four kidneys were, they were washed up, those thrombi were just washed out and they worked. So it didn't harm. So we used to nickname it donor DIC. It was they, they did have a mild thrombocytopenia, but the kidneys worked. Then it became known why this worked, why this happened. These people, you, if you had a head injury with a motor car or a, 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 an ordinary gunshot that bullet goes in and stays in the brain, pushes up the back of it, you didn't, that wasn't a problem. These were bullets that went in there and up the other side. And those countercurrent waves are of such velocity that the poor old jelly blade gets smashed and releases thromboplastin, which causes intravascular coagulopathy. It looks like it. And we realized then that these were these high velocity bullets. Now, what's the relation to Steve Biko? Well, Steve Biko, as you know, in the 70s, 80s, um, was arrested for being the hero that he was. And he was arrested in Port Elizabeth. And he was sent to Johannesburg in a fit state. He was examined by a very good friend of mine, a physician, who pronounced him. He, he didn't want to examine it. They got him because he was a highly respected uh, man. And interestingly, he worked at what is now the Donald Gordon that used to be uh, uh, the Colin Gordon. Oh, I, I can't, can't even know if it was before that. I, I can't remember the old name. But he worked there and he was a highly respected doctor. And he looked at CBK and he said, no, he, he's, he's fit to, to be jailed. So he was put in the central fort in Johannesburg where the police proceeded to pick him up by the heels up, bash his head against the concrete wall. And they beat him with, with truncheons and whipped him and tortured him. And I was asked to see his biopsy by Justice Chackleson, saying they said he died of kidney failure, not of trauma. And I looked at this and I said, this is exactly the same as the donor DRC in our transplants. It has nothing to do with this cause of death. He was tortured and beaten. By the police. So I had a hand in him being sentenced by the knowledge that I had gained from the data DRC. Fascinating. Now, I to conclude, I may have taken longer than I should. I've said here, yeah, mistaken from Buzz Aldrin with apologies. One small step for man, which is our immediate past,
goals and one giant leap for mankind, mankind. What we can humbly show to the rest of the world for their own use or otherwise, and also to present step by step. What are the thoughts of the members of this meeting? And if positive or negative, we'd like to know. We'd like to know how we can proceed. We, you know, I don't need to be told at this stage that you have to educate the public. This is what we've been told. Every meeting we've had since, I, I mean, I've been, I mean, I've been sitting on these meetings much longer than the younger people, and particularly some people in fact. This is going to take another 50 or more years. How long? I don't know. It will never be done if we don't do it now. And we are, I personally, I'm not willing to jeopardize the, the lives of, 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 of thousands of people. So I'm putting this forward for consideration. Now, before the next slide, I would just like to acknowledge many people with whom I, um, I, I interacted, uh, both, both in transplantation in South Africa and then particularly Mr. Farney de, de Toy. Mr. Farney de Toy, he was not a doctor, but he's the most knowledgeable information technology person. He, he gets, keeps me up to date with all, all recent research. He knows so much medicine. Uh, he, he's got a lot of diplomas. He's the uh, senior administrator of the Kidney Foundation. And we all know Farney de Toy. Thank you, Farney, for your, your incredible input over many, many years. Um, then uh, I think just a, a word about, about, about Cape Town and uh, before Cape Town, Johannesburg, Dr. Port, Dr. Portis and Dr. Masseuse, who, who uh, were urologists in Johannesburg and are highly involved in every single transplant that was done. The urologists now are not even considered as part of the team in Johannesburg now. In Cape Town is Alan Ponton, who is the Cape Town neurologist from long ago. I don't know who's there now. And uh, then there were the transplant surgeons, Jake Jacobson and Del Kahn. And this is many years ago. And my, my acknowledgement goes to them. And I have many interactions with them at meetings. I learned a lot from them. We discussed things. I hope they read something from me. So it's all contributed to, to what I experienced in, in transplantation. Um, then I must also mention uh, professor Dion Duplessis, who is a professor at, of, of urology in Pretoria. Now, in Pretoria, for many years, the urologists, the, the, the transplant unit sent the, the, the patient to the donor to the, you know, to the sister donor. But the urologists did the, the whole operation. They did it in the vascular surgery, the urology. The uro urologists, they had a, a vascular surgeon helping them, assisting. The urologists looked after the patients. If they had a medical problem, they then sent it to the nephrologist. They had, that's in the adults. The pediatricians have not been mentioned in this talk, and they should be. I've always found that the pediatric nephrologists and our recent pediatric surgeons are very, very much willing to cooperate with us adults, but not vice versa. So well done to our, to our pediatric co uh, colleagues. Lastly, uh, I did have a lot of interactions with uh, Professor C. Nell Rumpferty. He did transplantation for ages, but it was before the days we were doing transplantation in the black population. When the black population came along, and we all insisted that we do it in blacks, so before any of the change of government, he resigned from the head of surgery. He became the dean and he forbade any further transplantation in Brooklyn. And I had to go to the ISN and the ASN had a meeting in, 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 uh, in Montreal and I had to go explain to them about this. And they stopped it. So hands off to the ISN for that. They stopped his, uh, his, his shenanigans. So I thank you all for listening. It's been quite a long journey. I think it's a very interesting one, and I would be very happy to answer questions and comments. I think the questions must come first from the medical side at the meeting, and then from 
people who live at, um, the, at, at Waterfall Hills, and also not to forget um, questions from the cardiologists who are listening to the presentation. Thank you all very much for listening to me. So um, we want to thank also the um, Waterfall Hills Estate where we are broadcasting to the rest of Africa from this evening for their kind hosting of this meeting. Um, Prof, perhaps before we um, take any questions from the floor, if I might ask, um, we spoke at length about um, the cost involved in transplantation and certainly that was one of the um, issues raised in the survey that we sent out to our Afrin members. Um, I wonder if maybe you had any thoughts about the cost effectiveness of transplantation. Um, there are two aspects. Of, <clears throat> do, do I need a microphone? I think yes. I'm better not. There are two aspects of this. Firstly, um, when you dialyze somebody, it costs a fortune. It really is an incredibly expensive uh, business per year, per patient. And it's no wonder that governments are, in developing countries are concerned about this. But then on the other hand, when you realize that if you can transplant people and get them off the, uh, off the list, so to speak, the, it's like, a, it's, it's like a, a, a chain ladder. If you can get the, the, the ball rolling, you put them on dialysis and rapidly transplant. Them. Then there are slots available for new patients who won't die. And so these are the aspects that I'm trying to, to, to say that not only is it cost effective in terms of being a, a much cheaper um, way, but it saves many more lives. There are two aspects. Um, and for this, I think you need teamwork. Teamwork in South Africa is a lost cause. I think it still does go on in Cape Town, but certainly in Johannesburg, teamwork is a lost cause. Um, and uh, I don't know whether it's possible to re revive it at this, at this stage. It's very, all very well to say nice things. But uh, what I think at the end of the day, my most important message is that we need to interact with government. We can't do anything without government support. And I don't only mean our government, I mean the governments throughout Africa who are listening to this particular talk and other developing countries. Uh, we can't do what is done in other countries that sell the organs, they sell, they, they sell deceased organs. I'll, well, they just sell living organs. I'll give you my kidney if you pay me some money. And you, 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 you get people with big scars walking around. We can't, we can't tolerate that. And we can't tolerate uh, the, the sale of deceased organs either. But we need to meet with government to plan a way forward, both economically uh, and socially. And we need, if that works, to take our expertise elsewhere in Africa so that we can get share our expertise, as was mentioned in the talk. And finally, I, I, must, I must apologize for the, the sound. The sound in, when you record, uh, some, my words were blurred often, and it's, that's not how I, I, I spoke. You see, the way the uh, the linking comes out. So actually talking and giving this presentation like I'm talking to you now would probably be in, in the future, uh, it would get things over with more clarity. Like saying lymphos, when I'm talking about lymphocytes, I said the lymphatics uh, can't can or something. It's a leak of the lymph from the kidney that causes the fluid around the kidney to obstruct the function of the kitty. So there are a lot of uh, learning curves with this, this presentation. And I would like to take this opportunity of wishing the 
people who are going to give talks in future, I don't know how often they're going to be given, and I hope they've learned from this talk. And again, I would like to thank you, Malcolm, and I would like to thank anybody, everybody here for supporting me. It's been fantastic. You know, I worried about this. I thought there wouldn't be a, enough people, but I hope we now get to all enjoy a good finger supper. And thank you, one and all. So, Prof, before we perhaps before we close, there's a question there from Prof Nika, um, who says we've had various initiatives to increase deceased donation, including from unidentified trauma victims, which have not been successful uh, from the legal perspective. So. Do you have any proposals on increasing consent for deceased donor? That would be particularly important for our colleagues. I, 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 think, the, I think the only way around this is, um, is, the, is the financial way. You've got, to, you've got to have a plan where you go to the families and you talk to them. Um, I'd like to speak to Sarah, though I don't quite know the ins and outs of, what, of the question, but um, I think it applies to anybody, any deceased donor. This would have to be on the statute books as being permissible. And we're a long way from that. We, we, we're just approaching it. And we've got to take this whole thing step by step, including Sarah's question. And the, you know, when we do, if we do meet with government, that's the sort of question she must pose. Thanks, Sarah, for your question. So I think um, part of what Prof Nike is asking and feeding on from you is, the kind of concept of an opt-out versus an opt-in donation person. Uh, the question was opting out and opting in. Would you just describe it? So, and for the members of the audience with us, um, an opt-out um, process is where we assume that somebody is willing to donate their kidneys and we require proof that they don't want to donate kidneys. And an opt-in is kind of the, 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 the uh, reverse of that, where we require that consent is given before we can proceed with donation. I don't believe that would, it, it would ever work in the developing countries. It never has worked in the developing country. And uh, there are various reasons for that. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I don't think that the, the donor relatives have got a sufficient education of the matter. To know what they're doing. So I think it's a, basically an immoral thing to do in, in our developing country and in other developing countries. I think it's out of the question. And then Prof, perhaps a final question, if I might, from my side. I think what I found particularly inspiring about your talk was the way in which you showed that a small dedicated team willing to take risks, I think particularly, for example, of your work with TLI and ATG, can grow great things. So from small acorns, we grow great oaks. And I wondered if you think that kind of innovation is still possible in the 21st century when we're all sort of bound by extensive guidelines um, and whether or not given the kind of limitations that our colleagues north of the border face and access to the advanced tissue typing, et cetera, that we have, whether there's room for that kind of innovation as they expand their programs. Uh, thank you for that most difficult question of all. <laughs> and, and, and no thank you, but I'll, I'll try and answer. Um, I think there are countries in Africa, uh, you know, and, and, and there may be well be elsewhere in the developing world, but I, I'm talking about Africa, that are no uh, worse off than we are. And I'll give you some examples like Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, how's that for French? I think, you know, those places uh, are very, very like us. So again, like you go take things step by step, you take the country step by step, or the region step by step, and you sell them the concept, and you've got to discuss it with the local governments. And, and the, the two nodding must not just be with us, it must be with our government, with other governments, and if we're going to spread the word in our continent. I think it's a very long uh, uh, process, but the alternative is that we are not going to get any better, never mind for 50 years, 100 years, two, 500 years, it's, we're going to be like this. And you, we cannot allow our population who are un underprivileged to suffer when we have got kidneys, if I might put it in an expression, kidneys to burn. Thank you. Okay.
Um, so we are slightly over time, partly because of our um, electronic teething problems at the very beginning. But um, I'd like to thank you very much, Prof, for your willingness to share with us your expertise. It's been a great start to our transplant symposium. We hope going forwards to hold these online meetings at least once a month um, to spread the kind of academic output into the rest of the continent. And we look forward to involving our colleagues from north of the border in these symposium more often. But thank you very much, Prof, for opening thank up your response. Thank you again to our audience, Professor Jobik, and our online audience for your attendance.